1960 or something. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, future uh, uh, space missions that will uh, enable us to begin the search for life in the solar system. And I'm going to focus on uh, the Origin Space Telescope, uh, HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory, and Louvoir, the Large UV Optical Infrared Telescope. Yeah. Um, okay, that's fine. I can still talk. Uh, I'm also going to mention links, uh, even though I, was asked, I was, wasn't asked to, because um, I just think it's fair, and it actually has some interesting uh, applications, not as direct as the other three missions uh, to astrobiology. And one of the things I want to focus, uh, I really want to impress upon you, is that uh, really the time to do this is now. Um, so we probably thought we could do this 10 years ago, uh, but I would argue uh, pretty, uh, pretty strongly that we were wrong. Uh, we did not have the information we needed to design the missions in order to go and uh, be able to try to detect habitable planets and possibly detect biosignatures. Um, but now we do have that information, uh, partially from Kepler. We know that small planets are common and we have a rough estimate of the frequency of planets, rocky planets in the habitable zone, um, which we, I can talk about later. If you're really interested, it's a mess. Um, but we do have some estimate. Um, we also know that, uh, star, that most stars do not have uh, di uh, d dust disks in the terrestrial planet region. Um, right, so uh, there's going to be a quiz at the end. You have to name the artist and the song. Um, so uh, there, we, all, we also know from uh, LBTI uh, that, that most, uh, solar, most stars probably don't have dust disks that are so massive in the terrestrial planet region, zodiacal dust disks, that um, would obscure the detection and characterization of an Earth-like planet. Um, and also our technology has developed enormously over the last 10 years. Is it working? Okay, good. Let's hope it doesn't break. Um, okay, so this is my outline, um, and, uh, and well, so I'm going to start off by um, talking about how did we get here. Um, so this is a little astropolitics, just a little break from probably what you've been talking about the rest of the whole week, and I apologize for not being here the first four days. Uh, I'll explain why in a second, um, and I'm still wondering how Aki could have been here the last four days, but anyway, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so. Uh, Paul, way back in January 2015, which just tells you how long uh, those of us that have been working on this uh, have been working on this, um, uh, uh, Paul Hertz um, issued this missive, uh, I am charging the astrophysics PAG, so PAGs are program analysis groups. Um, these are uh, groups that uh, do analysis that then, uh, then feed into NASA's astrophysics division uh, to help give them uh, advice on what they should be spending their money on. Uh, I'm, I'm charging the PAGs to solicit community input for the purposes of commenting on the small set of large mission concepts to study, including adding or subtracting large mission concepts. And so he gave us a set of four large mission concepts, um, these, uh, which I'll get to in a second. And he basically wanted us to, as a community um, to get together and decide uh, if those were the four large mission concepts we wanted to study. Uh, for the 2020 decadal survey, or if we wanted to add one or subtract them or merge them. Um, and, uh, and so he gave us that, and he gave us basically uh, 10 months to uh, come up with an answer. So I and many other people flew all over. I went to meetings uh, with uh, uh, high energy meetings, head meetings. I'd never been to one before. I'm not even sure what an X-ray photon is. Um, but uh, I we ran around, and the, four pa the three PAGs, which are the exploration, exoplanet exploration PAG, the Cosmic Origins PAG and the Physics Phys PAG got together and they're the chairs of the E uh, executive committees of these PAGs. We worked together and we came up with a uh, joint agreement after about 10 months um, uh, in response to Paul's charge. So who is this Paul guy? Here he is right here. Um, uh, those of us that know him, uh, it's, it's, uh, a very familiar little smile he has there. It makes you wonder what he's thinking. Um, and, uh, and he's the NASA's astrophysics uh, division director. Uh, I've been working pretty closely with him uh, in, for a while now, a decade. And, um, and the astrophysics division has its priorities basically set by the decadal survey. So uh, Paul Hertz would, would, would uh, uh, call himself a decadal survey zealot. So what comes out of this next decadal survey, survey really matters for the future of astronomy and astrobiology and also planetary science, as I'll get to. Um, so, uh, so Paul issued this missive, um, and just like, you know how you show those uh, 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 pictures of presidents before they started office and after they started office? So this is what Paul looks like now. Um, and uh, I, I tried to find a before and after picture of myself after these last five years, but it was just too frightening and I just couldn't deal with it. Um, so, 
Um, so he gave us a list of three possible contenders. Um, three of these were drawn from a roadmap called Enduring Quests to Daring Visions, which is a really fun thing to do. It was like any other kind of roadmap, except we were told to be unencumbered by uh, fiscal constraints, which was really fun. And so Aki was on there. Anyone else in the room was on there? Oh, Natalie. Uh, we had a blast because we could just come up with whatever crazy idea we wanted, and that's what we did. Came up with some pretty crazy ideas, um, but they are all uh, basically doable. Um, well, at least the ones listed here are doable. There was a, there was one from further generation that uh, set that are probably not uh, doable right now. Uh, but um, three of them were um, the uh, far IR surveyor, the optical uh, UV optical IR surveyor, and the X-ray surveyor. Um, and these are basically what you would imagine. Uh, they basically are uh, large space telescopes that uh, that survey or are able to uh, take data on in these particular wavelength ranges. Uh, and then he added a fourth one just for fun that was drawn from one sentence of a 2010 decadal survey uh, called the Habitable Exoplanet Imaging Mission, or HABEX. And so for 10 months, we went around and decided whether or not we wanted to add something or take something away. A lot of people wanted to merge Louvoir and HABEX. Um, I argued against that and won, um, and, uh, and so eventually at the end of the day, we went back to Paul and we said, indeed, we should study these four missions. And so the joke is that basically all Paul wanted was us to just write in a post-it note, yes, we agree, these four missions, and hand it back to him. But instead, we spent 10 months and a lot of our time and a lot of money flying around agreeing to that. So uh, this is our basic point, is the PAGs concur that all four large mission concepts should be studied. We had a bunch of caveats none of which have been invoked. Um, so that's where these four large mission studies come from. Uh, they are now called, uh, LUVAR is still called LUVAR, despite efforts to try to come up with a more clever acronym. Um, HABEX is, uh, is still HABEX, but it's now the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory, not imaging mission, because we do more than imaging. Um, the far IR surveyor became the Origin Space Telescope, or now basically Origins, and the uh, X-ray surveyor became LINX. Uh, and see, these are four missions that have been mission concepts that have now been studied for uh, about a little over three and a half years. For most of us, a little longer than that for people like Aki. Um, and, uh, and why are these important, these concept studies, and why did Paul do this? Well, the reason why Paul did this is basically he, he said this to the uh, Astro 2020, their first meeting, which was on Monday of this week, which was that... Uh, NASA needs to ensure that robust mission studies allow for trade-offs on potential large strategic missions, blah, 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 conducted to prior to the start of the decadal service. So basically what he wanted was well-vetted concepts um, of large missions that could be uh, given to the decadal survey as contenders for large strategic missions that they could then prioritize. Um, and so they could prioritize one, they could prioritize two, four, or none. That's all, those are the options. Or they could prioritize something that's not on this list. Uh, all of those things are possible. But these four missions are probably going to be the most well-vetted large missions that are submitted to the 2020 Decadal Survey, I'm guessing. Um, and, uh, and Paul argues quite vociferously that large missions are important for uh, the future of astronomy. Uh, not everyone agrees with that, but um, he argues that. He said, and he, and he gave a couple arguments that, uh, against what people often say, things like, um, large flagship missions eat all the astronomy budget. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. So uh, I encourage you to go and look for this presentation on the Astro 2020 website. So uh, Astro 2020 will come up with its results next year at some point, uh, and they will prioritize something. We don't know what that is, um, but we're hoping that it's going to be one of these four missions. Okay, so uh, I really like this graphic. Um, uh, so these are basically the sort of symbols of each four of the missions. Um, and uh, we'd love for all four of them to be, to be uh, funded, but probably that's not going to happen. Um, maybe even none of them will be, but let's see what happens if they are. So first, we'll start off with links. I was not asked to talk about links, but I will anyway. Um, so these are slides, cur cur courtesy of Jeremy Drake. Typical caveats. If I say something right, it's because of him. If I say something wrong, it's because of me. Um, so links is basically Chandra. Um, you can think of it as Chandra with a much larger uh, collecting area or a much wider eye. Um, so it has the resolution of Chandra, sub arc second resolution, uh, but more like the area of Athena. Um, so it is, it is kind of the, the, the superhero of both. Um, and so that allows it to do lots of great things. I'm going to focus on things that we might care about. So one thing we might care about, and it's already been discussed, is high energy radiation on, uh, on uh, potentially habitable planets. 
um, that radiation may evaporate or strip off the envelope of those planets. Um, and links can characterize the high energy radiation exceptionally well out to stars quite far away, even relatively quiescent stars. And uh, as Aki said, M stars, for example, are basically never quiescent. Um, and so, and they can also look for coronal mass ejections. Um, they can look for flares, uh, or links can look for flares, can um, uh, try to estimate solar wind uh, uh, mass loading factors, things like that, um, which are all gonna be important for determining whether or not M dwarf planets, for example, are habitable. Um, so I just broke my own rule and called an M dwarf an M dwarf. Okay, so they'll do high signal to noise spectra in this region here um, uh, for stars out to 10 parsecs, which is roughly the radius out to which uh, the large mission concepts that I'm gonna talk about uh, are gonna be sensitive to. Luvar can go a little bit further than that out to maybe 15 parsecs. Um, the other thing that uh, LINCS can do is it can do X-ray transmission spectroscopy. So we already heard about transmission spectroscopy. You might not think you could do this in the X-rays, but you can. People have tried to do this with Chandra. It's hard. Um, you can decide for yourself whether or not you think this is a real transit or not uh, of, a, of HD 189733 detected by, or measured by Chandra. Uh, I'm not gonna weigh in on that, but I, what I will show you is this really cool movie of a simulation of what links would see. This is just the excess signal due to the atmosphere itself, just that little annulus um, as absorbed by the X-rays. In this case, the star is limb brightened in the X-rays as it is in the sun in certain wavelengths. And so you see this characteristic shape. And so uh, links could do this with one transit uh, in this energy range. So that would be very interesting to see if there's a very large exosphere if these planets are evaporating, for example. Okay, um, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk too much more about links. Uh, it can do lots of other great things as well. Um, I'll, so I'm gonna now turn to Origins, Habex, and Louvoir, and basically searching for signs of life. And here, I just wanna uh, make the caveat that I'm not talking about in necessarily SETI or intelligent life, uh, maybe just simple life. Uh, so we're not talking about radio here. Um, okay, so uh, that was a hint to the earlier thing, by the way. Um, so these are the scalings in terms of the, if you uh, want to talk about detecting habitable planets, these are the signal to noises that you get from the various methods that you might want to choose. Um, and this is assuming a mass radius relationship, the, the mass of the star, the radius of the star goes to the mass of the star and the luminosity goes as the mass of the star to the fourth power, which are approximate but roughly true. And what you find is that uh, for transits, you're highly biased towards finding habitable planets around low mass stars. Um, and that's because the habitable zones are closer, the planets uh, at a fixed size are bigger relative to their stars, and the duty cycle is higher. Um, and so that's great, uh, and that's just what's often called the small star opportunity, and we heard a lot about that with JWST. I'll say a little bit more about that with, uh, with origins. Um, radio velocity is also biased towards uh, finding uh, uh, habitable planets around low mass stars, um, not as much as transits, but still is. Um, I won't mention microlensing, um, uh, probably the first time I've ever given a talk and not mentioned micro Um Astrometry is actually sensitive to, to uh, star uh, habitable planets around high mass stars, believe it or not. Um, it's biased towards high mass stars. And direct imaging for reasons that I can't really get into, but I can ask, but if you want to ask me questions later, actually happens to be uh, most sensitive to tr uh, habitable planets, um, and at least in reflected light, around uh, solar type stars, which is fortunate uh, for us. Okay, so, but the signals are exceptionally small. We've already heard this. Um, I'm not gonna go through this too much. The transit depth um, for a habitable planet, Earth-sized planet around a star that's 0.1 uh, solar mass, the solar mass is 0.01% to 1%. Um, the uh, astrometry, forget it. Uh, direct imaging, um, I mean, maybe with, uh, yeah, it's hard. Uh, direct imaging, um, I'll get to this, the flux ratios, as has already been mentioned, are extremely small, um, even for uh, habitable planets orbiting M doors. Um, so this is the challenge and the separations, as I was also already mentioned, was very small. So this is the challenge. Um, so there are two paths you can go by if you want to detect and characterize habitable planets around sun-like stars, or at least I like to say that because every uh, good talk should have a Led Zeppelin quote in it. Um, and, uh, and of course that's not actually true because we just heard a very long talk talking about all the things you might be able to do with the ELTs. You could also imagine a far, uh, infrared uh, interferometer that could characterize Earth-like planets uh, in space. Um, but I'm just gonna focus on the two easiest paths to detecting and characterizing 
potentially habitable planets to look for habitability and maybe biosignatures. So um, I like to call this the two paths, the pale blue dot path. So this is Earth-like planets around sun-like stars and the small black shadows. This is uh, Earth-like planets around low mass stars. And uh, I, I was told that Courtney showed this. You may ask, why am I not attributing Courtney? Well, that's because Courtney got it from Aki and that's because Aki got it from me. Um, so uh, I'm the one who came up with this idea. <laughs> <laughs> just to set the record straight. Okay, so let's talk about the small black shadows, all right? And you, you remember that the, the, one, of my, uh, one of my topics, uh, little black spot on the sun today? Um, there you go, that's, the, that's this, small black shadows. And we already heard this, all the, about this. I don't even need to go through this. Thank you, Natalie. You did a much better job than I could have. We find the planets with MIRTH, ground-based surveys, MIRTH, TRAPPIST, Speculos, TESS, uh, space-based survey. Uh, tra TRAPPIST, of course, everyone loves most talked about planetary system I think maybe ever. Um, then we can do transmission spectroscopy um, or eclipse uh, spectroscopy. Uh, we can do this from the ground, of course, it's hard, but um, with JWST we heard how we can, we can probably do, um, we can do fantastic for hot Jupiters, and uh, we can do, do something for, for temperate planets around M dwarfs. Um, uh, we can at least say whether or not they may have an atmosphere, I think. I think that's pretty uncontroversial. Um, just whether or not we can actually detect biosignatures, I think, is very controversial as we heard. So I'm not gonna try to get into that. Um, so that brings us to origins, okay? So, so JWST is going to look at some potentially habitable planets that we know of already. That's the nice thing about this, this path, the small black shadows path, is that we actually have the targets or will have the targets already. Uh, so we know where to look. Um, JWST will look at them, spend many hundreds of hours looking at them, see if they have atmospheres. Maybe they'll get lucky and detect some um, molecule. But then we have origins, and origins is basically JWST aperture, except cooled to four Kelvin. Okay, so this is actually quite an impressive machine uh, if it were to be built. This is one of the four contenders. Um, uh, so, this, so that they had two architectures. The second one is, a, is six meters, so a little bit smaller than JWST. Um, but again, cooled to 4.5 Kelvin. Um, and uh, OST, uh, the good thing about OST is that it would have, um, it has sort of, the, the, the baseline is three instruments. I'm not part of the OST uh, uh, collaboration, so I'm not gonna go into this. But the one that we care about here is the, um, this one here, um, which goes from uh, 2.8 uh, to 20 microns with a resolution of 50 to two, uh, 300 roughly. Um, and so with that, what you could do is you could characterize, and for some reason, that so, so Origins has three uh, science cases. You'll notice a theme here with all, all of the uh, missions. They all have three science pillars. Um, but one of the one that we're gonna focus on is Are We Alone? So here's, a, I don't know who made this kind of dizzying animation, but this is the idea is that you have an M, uh, small black shadow going around your M dwarf. You collect a bunch of data during transits and you slowly beat down the noise with root n until you reach the systematic limit, which, is the, which they predict is a factor of several to maybe 10 times smaller than that of JWST. Uh, also has a longer wavelength range, and that allows you to maybe, that allows you to likely detect things like carbon dioxide, maybe water, meth methane, um, et cetera. Whereas with JWST, you're gonna do much worse simply because of systematic floor is expected to be worse by a factor of four or more. Um, so origins would give us the possibility of actually detecting um, bio, not only the potential uh, habitability, but maybe even biosignatures of small planets, temperate planets orbiting M dwarfs, um, at least for a reasonable sample. Um, and they have a tiered strategy, so and so that you know we worry about hazes. Um, uh, blocking our view uh, and, um, and making it difficult for us to detect these uh, species, but if you, uh, they do a, a tiered strategy, um, breaking down the, uh, their time until they can get to the, uh, the world that they think are, have clear enough atmospheres that they can actually observe these species. Um, and so in terms of numbers, uh, they expect to be able to detect sort of 12 uh, systems that have uh, where they can detect carbon dioxide, um, and, uh, and maybe four systems, three systems where they can detect water. And this is the comparison here with JWST where um, this is, the, this is the, the controversial part. Right? So it really depends on the systematic floor of JWST, which we don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, if it is what they are assuming it's going to be, um, origins will do substantially better. 
Um, so that's very exciting. Um, so that would be the, the, the sort of next step in the path of the small black shadows. Um, I'll then move on to pale blue dots. So this is, of course, the famous Carl Sagan picture of the Earth taken by Voyager. Um, and, uh, and this is a, now, you've probably seen this a thousand times. This is an Earth shine spectrum of the Earth taken by Maggie Turnbull. Um, showing various features that we would love to detect, including, for example, the vegetation red, ed red edge. Um, and so the challenge here is, are quite enormous. Um, so this is a spectrum of the sun at 10 parsecs, um, and this is a spectrum of the Earth um, uh, around that, that, that sun-like star at 10 parsecs. And you can see the contrast in the optical is of order 10 to the 10. Um, and, so, and the separation is of order 100 milliarc seconds for one AU at 10 parsecs. Uh, and you know you have like sort of uh, maybe 60 stars that you can do this with uh, within 10 parsecs. Um, so that means you have, need at least a two meter telescope. Actually, you need something larger than that, mostly for collecting area. Also because you can never really get that down to lambda over d, the diffraction limit, uh, regardless of what starlight suppression system you use. Um, it's better in the thermal infrared, but of course the um, uh, the diffraction limit is much larger, um, and so you would need something like an infrared. Uh, space interferometer in the thermal infrared. And that's something that we probably will do eventually, but we think an easier path, uh, believe it or not, is to go in the reflected light spectrum of the Earth. Okay, so the challenge, so we heard about the human hair held it at, at arm's length, that's, that's very impressive. I think my analogy is much more impressive. Trying to detect the Earth around a sun-like star at 10 parsecs is like trying to detect a firefly next to a uh, industrial searchlight like you see at LA. Um, where the firefly is a few feet away from that searchlight, uh, and the searchlight and the firefly are in LA, and you're standing in New York City. Okay, so that sounds really hard. Um, and so I went and I looked up the luminosity of a firefly. Turns out that's not so easy to find out. Um, and then I went and looked at some industrial searchlights. Oh, I have a transition here, I missed. Industrial searchlights um, and uh, uh, some owner's manuals, and it turns out a firefly is about a thousand times brighter compared to a searchlight than the Earth is compared to the sun. So the problem is even a thousand times harder than I just said. So how do we do that? Well, there's two ways. We already heard about one of them. And uh, is Nick Siegler here? No? Okay. So uh, one of them is coronography. We heard about coronography. Here the trick is, so here you're letting the light of the star into your telescope. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to block it so that um, the light uh, just 0.1 arc seconds away is suppressed by one factor in 10, in 10 million. Um, sorry, 10 billion. Um, and the problem is that light doesn't behave uh, very well. Uh, there are, you don't have a uniform wavefront. If you did, this would be a lot easier. You just put in a little chronograph, as we saw, and then a Leo stop, and your planet would miss it and go this way. But the problem is that your wavefront ha has errors in it. It's not uniform. So what you have to do, as was mentioned, is you have to take them out using a deformable mirror. So rather than spend more time on that, um, uh, so if you have that deformable mirror, you can take out those uh, inhomogeneities in your wavefront, and you can hopefully get down to this diffraction limit. Um, but another thing you can do, which is pretty clever, is uh, you just don't let the starlight into your telescope at all. Um, rather, what you do is you fly a baseball-sized occulter uh, that's about 76,000 kilometers away, baseball field size, sorry, that was a, that was a, wow, I wish it was just a baseball size. A baseball field size occulter, 76,000 kilometers away, and you have to align it within roughly one meter of your telescope uh, so we can block the star. It has to have a lateral tolerance of about a millimeter, and it has to have edges that are basically uh, sharp to about one micron. Um, so all of this sounds really, really hard, but if you, uh, but I encourage you, if you ever get the chance to go up to the Star Shade Lab in JPL, where they have a one-third size petal uh, that basically conforms to these uh, to, to these uh, specifications, and so actually the technology behind star shades is uh, is actually quite advanced over what it was even five years ago because of investments with NASA, um, and this is we are now within shouting distance of th of being able to do this. We think um, there's also the trick of actually just getting this wrapped up so that you can launch it, but there we use techniques of origami to do that. So it turns out star shades and chronographs have, are very complementary to each other. Um, so chronographs, again, you're letting the light into your telescope. Uh, but that's nice because it's, your telescope is very nimble, right? You can move it around very quickly. You only have one spacecraft. 
Um, and you're limited by basically the amount of time you have, not by fuel, because you're not have, because it's very easy to move your telescope around. So you can do lots of pointings of lots of stars. The problem is that um, the chronographs are inherently chromatic, which means that you can only collect, you can only block the light at that one part in 10 to the 10 over a relatively narrow band path and wavelength, roughly 20%. Um, so that means if you want to collect a spectrum over a relatively wide range, you have to do it in chunks, which either you have a chronograph of many different uh, paths, which starts to become complicated and expensive, or you have to do each path sequentially, which takes a lot more time. Um, it's also the case that it doesn't work as well for obscured primaries, although it turns out it's not nearly as bad as people thought it was five years ago. It's mostly a central obscuration that matters. And even there, people think theoretically you can solve this, although no one, no one yet has. You're limited in your what's called the outer working angle, which is the outer range in which you can suppress the starlight by this factor of one part in, in 10 to the 10. And that's limited by the number of actuators in your deformable mirror. Okay, so that sets your outer working angle. Now, Starship has almost um, <clears throat> the opposite pros and cons. So the pros are, it's basically achromatic, so you can get an, instantaneously, an instantaneous wide band path. It has very high throughput. Um, it's, uh, you can pretty, pretty, pretty much put whatever crappy telescope in front of it that you want, and you'll, because the light never actually makes it into the telescope so, uh, of the star, so you can still, uh, uh, you can still detect the, the planet. Um, you get very deep contrast. Uh, your outer working angle is basically how far you can go out is set by the size of your detector, which is generally a little much larger than you can get with current uh, deformable mirrors. Your inner working angle, basically how close you can get to the star, is, is almost independent of aperture, but not entirely. The problem, of course, is that it's a baseball diamond-sized uh, object that you have to move from uh, star to star, and it takes roughly two weeks to move it from each star. And so you're limited by fuel and you're limited at the number of stars you can look at. Okay, so these two are very complementary to each other. It also requires a separate launch in most cases. Um, so these two are very complementary to each other, which I'll mention in a second. So, um, so chronographs are nice because, again, they're nimble. Uh, you, can use the, you can use basically arbitrarily large telescopes and use chronographs. Um, and so this is an image, a uh, simulated image by uh, several people, including Aki right over here. Of, uh, of a, a solar system analog uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, 13 parsecs for the 12 meter telescope, so this is halfway between the two architectures of Louvoir. You can see Venus, you can see the Earth, you can see zodiacal light, uh, you can see Jupiter really well, um, and, uh, and here you can see the outer working angle is set by the number of actuators. This is a simulated uh, um, starshade image, uh, image taken with a starshade um, for a four meter telescope. 52 meter star shade. It's a planetary system at 8.4 8 parsecs. Um, and you can see a sort of a Kuiper belt ring. You can see if you have a very large outer working angle, um, you can see several planets in here. And one of these happens to be an analog of the Earth by design. Um, and uh, these, two, uh, these two are representative of the two mission concepts that I talked about, I'm going to talk about now, Habex and Louvoir. So Habex, the, the preferred ar architecture is a four meter chronograph with a 52 meter star shade to take advantage of this complementarity. Louvoir is, uh, is, has two concepts. One is Louvoir A, which is a 15 meter telescope. Uh, obviously it has to be segmented because it, uh, in order to get it in the fairing of the launch vehicle so you can launch it. And then it uh, unfurls and the secondary deploys, has this large uh, sun shield so it uh, doesn't get hot. Um, uh, has a very large field of regard. You can see it's on this gimbaled thing that makes it uh, very easy to move around and have a large field of regard. So that's really great. And of course, it's an enormous aperture. 15 meters is just incredibly enormous. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of how impressive that is. Um, and then they have a second architecture, which is also impressive. It's actually off axis um, and it's an eight meter. Um, so, and, and when you start getting up to these apertures, star shades start to become a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, clumsy and especially at 15 meters. Eight meters, you might be able to get away with the star shade. Uh, but 15 meters is going to be pretty hard. So they did not, they study, they are probably in a future study are going to consider an eight meter with a star shape. Um, so I'll say a little bit about HABEX, the Habitable Exoplanet Observatory. Again, three science cases, just like everyone else. Um, two of them are very similar. One is to look for nearby worlds and find potentially habitable environments and look for biosignatures. And the other is to study, sorry, uh, a small set of nearby stars basically beating down to the noise floor. 
Um, again, chronograph, star shade, we have other uh, instruments for other science, non-exoplanet science. Um, so the timeline for all of these is sort of expected to be mid-2030s. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Um, and so I'm going to mention two of these. One is our uh, search for habitable worlds. So we're going to survey about 50 stars with the chronograph, look for things that are potentially habitable, then measure their orbits with the chronograph, see if they're actually in the habitable zone, then move the star shade over if they are, and then get a broadband spectrum of them. Um, again, using this complementarity of the star shade and the chronograph. Um, and, uh, and then, um, and the hope is that we get something that looks like this. So you've already seen this. This is a, a simulated spectrum of a Earth-like, of an Earth twin at 8.4 parsecs. Um, this is, uh, 230 hours of observations. So, you know, you have to be patient. Um, there's not a lot of photons you're getting from this 30th magnitude uh, planet. But you can see we can get, um, basically from 0.4 to 1 microns in one go with the star shade, and then we can move the star shade in or, in or out to get a longer or shorter or longer wavelengths to detect, for example, the ozone cutoff or additional water features. Um, so that's quite powerful. And then, and then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to look uh, with HabEx at the nearest eight stars that are uh, suitable, we think, for this um, to try to look for family portraits like this, for example. And the nice thing is because uh, with the star shade, you, uh, you can just have an IFS integral field spectrograph, you can actually get simultaneous spectra of all the planets within a certain range, two by two arc seconds in this case, um, and look for not just Earth twins, but also put it in context of giant planets that might be living further out. And you can characterize them again over a relatively broad wavelength coverage because of the star shade. Okay, uh, these are the eight systems. Uh, you know them, most of them by name. Uh, the nice thing is that Hollywood has already told us that about half of them have life, so we're guaranteed to be successful. That's great. Um, all right, uh, now I'm going to go on to Louvoir. If that, that sounds interesting. You should really talk, we talk, talk about Louvoir. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, I'll try to get through this quickly. Louvoir also has three sides fillers. Um, uh, uh, and unfortunately, I won't get to talk about our, the applications of our solar system. I will just mention this. This, I believe, is a Juno image of Jupiter. And when given, and so what Lavoir, the Lavoir team did, according to Aki, is they, they went and tried to get images of, of systems that had been imaged by flybys or, or, or orbiters, um, and then degrade them to the resolution of Lavoir A. And so they got this image of Juno and decided to degrade it to the resolution of Lavoir A and realized that the resolution of Lavoir A was actually better than that of Juno. So, uh, so they had to, I guess, enhance it. Um, anyway, this is part of the reason why my, my talk is so like uh, so memory intensive is because the 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 uh, resolution that you get with the Louvoir is incredible. Um, you can actually resolve 100 parsecs out to the edge of the observable observable universe with Louvoir A. Um, so uh, for instruments as well, um, I won't spend too much more time on that. I will show you this because Aki asked me to. Um, think Star Trek in the back of your head, the beginning of the Star Wars, sorry, the beginning of the Star Wars uh, movie, the, first, the, the real one, the first one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's poor Hubble, about to get like, so I would be really disappointed if the Louvoir team actually decided to put this into an Earth orbit. I mean, that would not be a good idea. L2 is much better, but anyway, this is good to make Hubble, Hubble feel bad. Help me. Um, anyway, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's a pretty impressive machine. Um, it's a, not, not a pretty, it's an amazingly impressive machine. Um, and Louvoir B is also impressive as well. I mean, because come on, eight meters in space is just, an, you get diffraction limit automatically. You don't have to worry about the atmosphere. It's, a, it's a incredible. Um, in the case of Louvoir, um, uh, because they have a chronograph and they, can, they have to get spectra sort of piecemeal, um, they have a tiered strategy to try to hone down on the best candidates, similar to the tiered strategy that, that, that HabEx has, except uh, it's, it's taking advantage of the chronograph rather than the chronograph and star shade compatibility. Um, so they have this tiered strategy where they eventually get down um, to, uh, to the most uh, most Earth-like systems that they can possibly find and characterize them and get spectrum of them. And because of the large aperture and the small inner working angle because of the large aperture, so they have large, a lot of collecting area, small, uh, high resolution, Louvoir A would be able to detect if the frequency of, of, 
of, uh, as A to Earth, the frequency of rocky planets in the habitable zone is, uh, point, is 24%. Uh, Louvoir A would find 54 of them and characterize them. Louvoir B would find 28 of them. That's comparison. I'll show you the yield for HabX is eight. Um, so it's quite a bit, quite a bit better. Um, so even if they don't find anything, like all of these things are barren rocks, then we've learned something very, very interesting, right? The null detection is, uh, can tell us that the frequency of Earth-like planets is less than 5% from with Louvoir A. So that's a very interesting result. Kind of a lonely result, but an interesting result. Um, what happened? Oh, okay. Uh, Okay, and 28%, and for, for Louvoir B, it's 10%. So these are the kind of spectrum they would get. Again, they have to do this piecemeal. So um, they can actually do, be smart about it because um, there's not a lot of information, as Ty basically said, in this Raleigh scattering regime, but there's much more information here with this oxygen line and these water lines. But then as you get to the near infrared, the water lines get broader, so you don't have to do as high a resolution. So you can, um, so you can mitigate the fact that you have only relatively narrow bands due to the chronograph using this tiered strategy and by wisely choosing where you're actually spending your time integrating. So that's uh, very, that's great. And you can see they actually get all the way out to two microns where HabX can't get that because they just don't have the photons. So these are the two yields of Louvoir A versus HabX for different kinds of planets. And I wanna emphasize, we think a lot about Earth-like planets. So rocky planets uh, in the habitable zone trying to characterize them, look for signatures of habitability, look for biosignatures. And so we focus a lot on this green bar, which is, you know, 55 or 54 for Louvoir A. It's only eight for HabX, but nevertheless, the chance of failure with eight is relatively low, assuming our estimates for A to Earth are, are roughly correct. Um, but I think what's important to recognize is we also get all of these other planets and spectra of all of these other planets. Uh, and even HabX will get hundreds of other planets in very high resolution, re re very high fidelity spectra from 0.2 to 1.8 microns. So we're going to learn a lot about the atmospheres of planets, not just Earth-like planets, but other planets as well, if you happen to care about other planets. So I'll end with two quotes. One, um, this is a, I think every Louvoir talk is, 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 uh, is uh, must end with this quote. Um, it's a search for life in other worlds is both a profound and a profoundly difficult endeavor. Uh, that's true. I find that a little bit depressing. I like this one better, um, partially because I wrote it. Um, for generations, humans have looked up at the stars and wondered whether or not we are alone. Wonder at this question unites us. It is unknown whether or not the, this will be the first generation uh, that uh, to learn that life is common throughout the galaxy or the first to discern that we're actually uh, relatively lonely. But we do know that we are the first generation that has the capability and the scientific knowledge to do this if we so choose. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks. No, no, we have, we start young. <laughs> I'm dying to know, to what extent were techno signatures discussed during these conversations, or was it considered kind of a dirty word? Oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, Louvoir, the Louvoir and Habex uh, techno signatures are not what we're looking for, right? What we're looking for is potentially habitable Earth. Same thing with origins, I think, is, is true. Um, and during the National Academy, so I co chaired this report with David Charbonneau. We did talk about techno signatures a little bit, uh, but we decided that it was pretty far out of the scope of what we really wanted to look at. The astrobiology report, which was uh, happened at the same time, I believe they did talk about uh, techno signatures to some extent. Um, so it, it just, we wanted to go about really focusing on uh, the path that is sort of a, so what I, the way I think about things like techno signatures in SETI is thinking of like a balanced portfolio. Those are high risk, but high reward things. So you want to put a little bit of your money in that, but you want to put most of your money in the low risk, high, uh, you know, maybe low yield things. Uh, sorry if you did say about this, but what is the idea behind liver A and B? Oh, like so, so, okay, so uh, uh, let me just take a step back. Habex also studied eight other architectures, which I didn't have time to talk about. So together, Louvoir and Habex studied, uh, studied um, uh, 11 architectures. 
We often get the question, which is why this is the next slide, what's the difference between Habex and Louvoir? And the answer is, well, we actually have very similar science cases. Um, uh, and we've, well, first, we've devoted a hell of a lot of time developing these missions. These are very well-polished missions. There's 11 different architectures that span 2.4 meters to 15 meters. Okay, and there's lots of differences between them. You, you, you reach breakpoints in your technology where you have to change your architecture, like for example, having a segmented versus a monolithic mirror. Um, and we wanted to offer the decadal survey a buffet of options uh, that would be responsive to whatever constraints they thought they, were, were, uh, they needed to be adhered to involving cost, technology risk, et cetera, uh, schedule, et cetera. And so by studying this, these range of options, we, they, we didn't force them to have to try to interpolate, which it turns out interpolating is not trivial. Um, things are not what you'd expect. So when you go down from 15 meters to eight meters, you really want to go off axis because when you're on axis, you start to lose a lot of planets because of the central obscuration, right? And so an eight meter off axis telescope, probably on axis telescope, probably wouldn't do that much better than say a four meter habex, a little bit better, but not as much. So that's the main reason is to give the decadal survey a variety of options. So you showed this kind of like best case scenario spectrum, right? Eight, eight parsec, G star. And then there's this number of a yield of 50. So we probably won't get 50 of these spectra. So can you maybe shed some light on how this 50, maybe we get five of these 50, we have a spectrum like that. And for 45, we just know they're there or how so, is that? Yeah, so I will, I, I'll, I'll answer this for first for Habex since I'm the co, one of the co-chairs of Habex. For Habex, we get full spectra like I showed. For all eight, the whole eight, all eight of them, count them, uh, of those, of those Earths. I, I think, I think for, ha for Louvoir, I'll let Aki answer. Um, yeah, not for every single one of them. It's sort of here, right? Or for for most, for all of them, we get partial spectrum that can detect methane water. For the ones that pass that test, we broaden and get another band pass. Uh, you mean oxygen water? No, is it? Okay. Anyway, okay. Those, okay. Um, then if those pass, we can go to oxygen, we can go to this, we can go to that. It's sort of like it's a filter. So um, I think if you, we could, and you said for six months a lot of the characterization time, I think we could get, I can't remember the number, I think it's like, I don't know, like 20-ish complete spectrum. But we probably would do that. We would filter and take the Right. So the, yeah. So that's the that's the that's how Habex you know uses its strengths to try to maximize the science yield, and Louvar uses its strengths to maximize the science yield. So, for example, for for Habex, methane is just basically impossible for us to detect. Unfortunately, it's just too small of an aperture. Mike or Mike. Scott, oh, what are the prospects for extending the wavelength range of Habix and Louvar out to five microns? So, so um, we've definitely thought about it for, for Habix, going out to five microns, partially because you keep harping on this. Um, thank you. Um, uh, we consider this an en enhancing option, not a, not a, a, a requirement. Um, uh, and uh, part of the reason why, um, and just for the general audience, uh, part of the reason why going out to five microns is not something that we pushed very hard on is one, because your detector technology is not as advanced, um, and also because the thermal emission from the telescope starts to matter, and that matters much more for Habex because it's four meter in a relatively small aperture. But for things that are photon noise dominated, like looking at M-dwarfs and transits around M-dwarfs, there you're dominated by the star, the thermal emission doesn't matter, and probably we might want to go to five microns, but it was because of the detector of TRLs that we were we were trying to back off a little bit. I think Louvoir has been a little bit more aggressive. Um, yeah. So, for example, so the instrument, the, your instrument concept, you do exactly that. It is in the Louvoir append, the appendix of all the stuff that you're doing. Other instruments one could do with Louvoir, and actually another JAXA actually designed another one to do that exact same thing. So there is obviously some interest in pushing pushing uh, long work down to, down to five microns to do transit spectroscopy. Right. Um, it's taught, you could do it with Louvoir. You know, we have four instant phase. This is what the, the science and technology definition we decided 
prioritize. But of course, when the time comes, I mean, there are other instruments you could do. You could check with each other later, or in a first generation alternate, or in a second subsequent generation. Right. Although I may not be here to see it, I just comment that if you feel that transit spectroscopy is likely to be important in the era of blue bar and habex, having the ability to go out to longer wavelengths in a situation where you're stellar photon noise dominated right. and not background dominated could be quite valuable scientifically and need not stress the payload right. dramatically because you don't necessarily have to cool the telescope. Right. So uh, I think that should be kept as an option. So so we are definitely key with you. I mean, I, I have definitely kept that in the back of my mind constantly because of conversations with you and other people. I've only just realized, so I knew that Louvoir actually had a very strong transit spectroscopy case. I didn't realize how strong the case was for even Habex until Eric Lopez did some simulations for us, and they're really impressive, um, at least for Jupiter-sized planets. And even for MDORF uh, terrestrial planets, they're pretty impressive. So uh, that really does uh, make us want to think that we want to go to longer wavelengths. And let me just say one sort of, uh, sort of astropolitical thing. Um, no one should walk away from this room thinking that any one of these architectures are going to be built to the way we to print, right, the way we've written them. Um, they're going to be they're going to be thought about carefully. Maybe something intermediate is going to be studied, um, and uh, they're going to be further optimized. Because even after three and a half years, there's still optimization we could be doing. Um, I know that in Habex, there are things we wish we had time to do. We just don't. Our our report. Oh, I didn't actually mention why I haven't been here for four days, and neither should have it's Aki. That's because our our final reports are due on April on August 22nd. Um, so I've been spending the first four days of my week here up at JPL working with the Habex team trying to get ready for the final report. Aki must have minions or something, I don't know. Um, so uh, so we're, these, are, these are just, these are point designs, these are existence proofs that we hope will help guide the decadal survey uh, to decide uh, on where to go next and what option to study that will eventually get built. And then we can reconsider instruments and we will, of course, make this trade that you, that you, um, that you wisely keep emphasizing.